Okay, so on to meditation PPM um, number 19 uh, on this third day of March. We are, I am, in reading today's um, meditation on schedule insofar as this is the one that would have been number 19, the 19th meditation that I wrote back in 2004. However, because 2004 was a leap year, um, the date that this was written doesn't correspond to the day, uh, today's date. So we are, oh, how interesting. So last night in my meditation, I talked about belatedness, 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 that we were behind. In fact, we're ahead. Or, and it's funny that I continue to use the term we because I suppose as I record these, I'm envisioning others listening to them and checking it out. So I'll, I'll, it's an inclusive endeavor. And I talked about it um, a while back. I think it was one of the first or second meditations, how I use this, um, the plural, we, uh, throughout when I'm writing it. And again, it's, it's meant to be inclusive, although it, it, at times when I'm reading it, I'll confess that it feels a little irritating to me. Nevertheless, yesterday I was talking about how um, we were behind. That is to say that the, um, the meditations were a day behind. In fact, it's, I completely got it wrong. We're a day ahead. I'm a day ahead. Today is March the 3rd, but the meditation I'm about to read is from March the 2nd. Wow. Why is that exciting? Well, it's just all of a sudden I realized it. So in some, in some respects, I, I had a sort of like a small aha moment because it was just more of a, wait a second, aha. In fact, we are ahead. How does that change then, this notion of belatedness, where I was saying we're lagging behind and we're a little bit behind, and even though, no, we're in the leap. The leap year that this was written in remains, um, and so we're ahead. We're, 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 we're thrown into the future. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Um, it really doesn't matter in, in some sense. This is sort of just playing with numbers, right? Because this is the 19th meditation. Today is the 19th reading of it. So PPM 19 uh, corresponds to the 19th meditation. But it's sort of interesting that um, we're a day ahead. So this is March 3rd. This is originally written March 2nd. Um, maybe not such a big deal. So yesterday's meditation, um, two days ago, in number 17, Lao Tzu was introduced, and with Lao Tzu, uh, Carl Jasper's reading of Lao Tzu, and I talked about in PPM 18, the one I recorded yesterday, how Jasper's um, was important. He gave me uh, or offered me some space. Now, it's interesting because you know, despite this being experimental and it's, despite my uh, desire to want to do things that are countercultural, that is to say counter the academic culture of doing things in a certain way, the fact remains is that you still, one eye, still has uh, this, this, this sort of uh, ghost of legitimacy haunting us and haunting the project. What does that mean? Well, it means that you, I'm tentative in certain respects, and I was tentative in moving into uh, writing about Eastern philosophy. On the one hand, there's a good reason for that. I'm not trained in Eastern philosophy, and the training I received as an um, well, it, it, that started formally training, my formal training in philosophy started at the end of my high school uh, with Ron Kaplow, uh, my English teacher, and he introduced us to, you know, the sort of schools of uh, Stoicism, Epicureanism, and I think we did a little Kant, um, and then it, they, they really got going at Fordham, and then, you know, culminated with the graduate work at the New School. Throughout all that time, though, um, there was some work done in Eastern philosophy at Fordham with your cousins, with his ecumenical stuff and his inter-religious dialogue stuff that was sort of, it was theology, but it really was philosophy of religion. Uh, but for the most part, I don't have a training in Eastern philosophy. So that's the one sort of legitimate reason to worry about legitimacy, if you will, uh, that I don't have a training in it. And that matters. It matters to me, and, and so therefore it matters to this project that, you know, we're, it's not just, um, uh, you know, I'm not just making this stuff up, that I have a training in it, and that, that my training is what gives me the sort of traction, right, to get this thing going and to be something that's, that's, um, has, has value for me, um, and for others, I hope. Now, the second reason that, um, this sort of ghost of legitimacy is haunting me is because 
when you make a move into Eastern philosophy, uh, particularly these days, um, you have to be concerned that it's not just something that is too popularized, and that is to say, um, something that smacks of a kind of um, New Ageism or a sort of um, kind of yogism, um, uh, which is to say it's an appropriation and then a dilution of a very serious tradition, right? Um, and that's the, that's the concern, that, you know, when you call on Eastern philosophy, it should be done with the same seriousness as if you were calling upon any Western philosopher, right? And if you don't take it up in a serious way, then you are diluting it and you're just appropriating it and making it do something for you that um, is uh, far from what um, the sort of spirit of the, of the, of the articulation of the, of the work of, um, um, originally uh, was. So a couple reasons why I think there's legitimacy in making this move with Lao Tzu. Um, one of them is the um, sort of analogy between Heidegger's um, question, how is it with the nothing, and his musings on um, das Nicht, the nothing, uh, and then a lot of the writing he did in his later um, uh, uh, work around uh, Gelassenheit, Letting Be, there is um, there an analogy, and it's been explored by, by, by um, scholars with that Heidegger and um, Zen Buddhism, um, and also, to a certain extent, Taoism. He himself mentions it, and he has a dialogue in the book that's organized, I think it's called The Way of Language. Um, there is a dialogue, and it will be will be encountering this dialogue and I, I may have already read part of it but it, it becomes part of the um the writing of the experiment where he has this dialogue that he he recounts uh with a a student from japan may have been a faculty member but a scholar a philosopher from japan who visited with heidegger they had a dialogue and it's um it is uh, uh, uh it's part of the collection on the way of language and um, so Heidegger himself recognized uh, and was open to um, the connections that uh, Japanese philosophers were making with this work, um, specifically in terms of the similarities with, uh, with Buddhism, and Zen Buddhism. And then also I was led to understand, uh, I sat in on a seminar at Stony Brook with Lorenzo Simpson on Heidegger. Oh, wait, Heidegger was a principal figure, it wasn't on Heidegger, but he was a principal figure. And um, it was um, uh, discussed that Heidegger um, had begun a, uh, um, a translation of, of the Tao Te Ching. Um, and uh, I, I think that the, 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 the project blew up at some point because um, maybe it was Heidegger's temperament or something. But um, um, at any rate, it, he didn't get very far with it. But all that to say is that it's, um, if, if Heidegger is kind of like my main interlocutor in this project, then um, his turning to and being open to Eastern philosophy is one, um, one, one uh, again, a point of legitimacy. And then also just philosophically in terms of the analogies I'm making, sort of that gives credibility to that move. Jaspers is then the, the third and final sort of uh, uh, um, credibility test or legitimacy, legitimacy test that I think I can pass um, with turning to uh, Eastern philosophy. That is to say, Jasper's uh, two-volume short collection, edited by Arendt, um, originally were lectures that he gave on the radio. Um, and in these lectures, uh, he took up um, um, Lao Tzu and um, the Tao Te Ching, and that's what was included. So back uh, then to a reading, and uh, like I said, but where we left off was um, a discussion of um, the Tao Te Ching, and let's see where we're picking up. And then today, on um, this day, uh, March the 3rd, uh, the meditation was originally written March the 2nd, but again, because that was a leap year, um, what was the 19th meditation written in 2004 uh, is the 19th meditation read in 2014, but the days uh, were a day ahead, not a day behind. And therefore, I can already see in the first sentence, discussion of the leap, so maybe there's a whole other connotation to the leap. We have said that learning is that leap into the impossible, the mysterious, profound, unknown, and perhaps unknowable, nothing, not yet. Learning is the ongoing encounter 
and engagement with this no thing, not yet. The no thing, not yet, is the very condition for the possibility of learning. Thus we say that learning marks our relationship with being, insofar as being unfolds in the play of appearing and disappearing. The flood and ebb of being's unfolding is the very essence of the condition of learning. Learning is a seeking, an inquiry, a discovery of what is and is not. We seek after that which hides, which is veiled, which is shrouded from us. We are enticed by this veiling. In our seeking, we explore the unmarked paths. We have been thrown off the well-worn straightaway highway of instrumental reason and find ourselves wandering. The news we have received, <coughs> the news we have received via the evocative news of the first questions has thrown us into our wandering. But our wandering is not aimless, although in learning we don't have a single purpose unless we identify the attempt to inquire or ask about our relationship with being as the essence of our wandering. To say learning is a seeking of what is and is not suggests that perhaps our wandering, which is situated in this relationship, is a questioning about this relationship. The relationship with being is indeed the essence of learning, for it marks the way when we ask a friend, which way are we going, we want to know the route we are taking. But we also might ask, how is it that we intend to get there? The way of learning is both the path, our route, and the manner. We call the way of learning hermeneutics. Learning is the hermeneutical situation, questionableness. We are reposed in learning and become questions to ourselves. Like Socrates, we are perplexed. But our perplexity is brought on by the news about the ground of existence as exceeding our subjectivity. We find ourselves to be already in a situation of relatedness and a relation, but this relationship is unclear, reveals itself to us as a mystery. Yet it is this mystery which evokes in us a restlessness that sets us on our way. Our wandering is provoked by the mystery of this relationship. We wander down a path in asking about this hiding. Where does being go? when hiding, ebbing, disappearing. We ask about concealment and we listen to the saying of Wu Yi Wu. Lao Tzu says of the Tao, quote, eluding sight, eluding touch, profound it is, dark and obscure, unquote. We encounter what is beyond our grasp and we find once again that our juridical voice is silenced. We ask again about this concealment, this hiding, for we seek to know something, indeed, everything about this relationship with being. We again encounter the primeval chaos, the obscure, fathomless, mysterious, unknowable. No light shines forth in absence. Our demands are not met. They are thwarted, destroyed. The way of learning is hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is destruction. The juridical, prosecutorial subject is annihilated. As Heidegger might say, quote, in order to abandon my own path of thinking to namelessness. The path of learning is not our own, nor is it the others, but the relational unfolding of being. It does not belong, for it is and is not, and cannot be grasped or claimed. Learning claims in claiming we, uh, we are reposing. We wander the path of learning, our location in the relational unfolding of being, and discover our destiny, our appointed task. We repose and, quote, that stillness may be called reporting that we have fulfilled our appointed end, unquote. Learning is a calling, and our response to this address is interpretation. In learning, we respond with evocative speech and poetic thinking. In learning, we repose and become interpreters, as Heidegger has provocatively suggested. Hermanus Eisentontheon. We are interpreters of the gods. And that's where it ends. So that was an interesting um, meditation. And I'll tell you, my, my feeling in reading that is that it's one of these, you know, it's, uh, I've mentioned it, and I'll mention it almost any day. I sort of evaluate them. And <clears throat> this one, I can tell in reading it that I was, it was a little bit of a grind. Um, there was some, past, there was some um, composition some integration. There were, was a pulling together of lots of the different pieces, so there was this feeling of trying to synthesize. 
Uh, but there was a difficult to get going, that is to say. I could feel that I was really having a hard time moving along. You know, I was sort of, I wouldn't say stuck, but um, I, was, I, was, I was looking for something. I was looking for um, some, some notes to play, I suppose you could put it, um, and some way to, 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 to make a solo, which, by the way, is another interesting um, way of describing this writing. It's, it's, a, it's a bit like improvisational soloing. Um, I would, I would, I would definitely go with that one. Um, but so where I went, where I, and which is at the end of the first paragraph, was to the sentence we call the way of learning hermeneutics. And um, and then sort of define the hermeneutical situation as questionableness, being questioned. So the relationship or the way of learning is hermeneutics. Now recall a couple of days ago I said hermeneutics is destruction. And then I reiterated that what's being uh, destroyed is, um, you know, this I call the juridical prosecutorial subject is annihilated. And then I cite Heidegger who says, and this is, this is again an example of where his writing and Eastern philosophy, Lao Tzu in particular, really have a nice connection. He says that Hermeneutics is, destru is destruction. In order to abandon my own path of thinking to namelessness. So this is this notion that the path of thinking is an encounter along the way with the ineffable. Like, so the, 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 the path of, of, of learning, that movement, is moving along uh, a border, if you will, where uh, language sort of gives way. So the threshold, which I talk a lot about, and more so now, is the boundary uh, between the familiar, or what we can call upon in terms of language, and what's not just unfamiliar, but beyond language. In yesterday's commentary, I talked about, um, and just observing my son, who came on for a cameo appearance, uninvited, of course, <coughs> That the spont and in the spirit of spontaneity, which is where children are, um, that in observing him, you know, you see how children at, at, at this young age um, just, they don't speak because they don't yet have the language. Now, by that I mean that they don't, they see something like the number 12, and he recognizes it's a number. He recognizes that one of the numbers is one and the other number is two, but doesn't quite have the language. Uh, yet of 12. He doesn't have the concept 12. He doesn't understand. He can knows that 12 is a number, but symbolically, uh, to see a 12 isn't to make the connection that's the number 12, and the number 12 is 12 ones. So 12 singular, whatever. So, um, <coughs> in the sense in which Heidegger says, <coughs> we abandon my own path of thinking to namelessness. I'm going to get this. In the sense of which we're, um, that learning is a path under which we encounter namelessness. Namelessness then is uh, a way of describing um, what's beyond language. So again, I find this just very straightforward to me in terms of, of the claim that learning happens at the boundary of language. That's where the event of learning takes place. So it's pre-linguistic. We don't yet have language uh, and in, in the moment where we are in the event of learning. And so there's a very raw phenomenological experience going on. And so a lot of what I'm talking about is this, this movement. And um, you know, I keep going back and, and forth. And so that the relationship then, this defines a relationship with being, because the relationship with being that I'm talking about here is uh, one of being and learning, then beings withdraw, beings disappearance, all of this is, you know, ways of talking about the aletheia, which is the Greek word for uh, truth, which is a truth uh, that, uh, truth as appearing and disappearing simultaneously. So what shows hides. So it's sort of, and I will talk a lot about that. So when I talk about um, our relationship with being as a mystery, um, because being is both uh, revealing and concealing all the time, 
these are all different ways of exploring aletheia, you know, absencing, presencing, and absencing. So to say that this, and that creates a mystery, okay? That creates a question. What is it that, uh, how is it that being is hiding, or where is it that being goes? I like that question. And the question, where is it that being goes uh, when it hides, is in some ways to ask the question, how is it going with the nothing, right? So the question, how is it with the nothing, then becomes, how is it going with the nothing? So how are you in relationship with the nothing? How are you moving along with the nothing? And the, the presumption of that question is that you are, one is being in learning, one is being drawn into um, the, the, the withdrawal, drawn into the withdrawal, drawn into, it's like a gravitational pull, uh, that we're drawn into this withdrawal of, of being. And so that the withdrawal of being into the nothing is a, a taking of us into the place of learning. Right? So, we, that, so we're drawn into the place, the event, uh, place, time, which is the event of learning. Um, and now, going back to Heidegger, this quote is interesting because he says, in order to abandon my own path of thinking to namelessness. Again, the annihilation of the juridical uh, or what I call here the prosecu prosecutorial subject um, happens when my own path, my claim to my path, is abandoned um, to namelessness. And this is very powerful if you look at the history of uh, 20th century philosophy because at this point then, um, existentialism in the Sartrean sense of it um, is eclipsed or it's overcome, right, because now we don't have this strong subject who is making decisions and who is exercising their freedom as a freedom of the will, um, you know, as autonomy. Here, on the other hand, what we have is kind of the, for me, the early Nietzsche, the birth of tragedy, um, the one the, where the, the subject is annihilated. So it's, it's, it's interesting because here I don't draw on, on birth of tragedy at all in these early meditations, in these meditations at all. It's only recently that I've been looking at it, but you can see where Heidegger is getting this uh, post-subjective uh, um, ontology. You know, and I think it's in many respects from Nietzsche, which is, who, is, who is greatly misunderstood because um, you often hear this phrase, will to power, and that's mistaken for the individual willing themselves. So will to power sounds like um, a powerful will, a person with a powerful will bringing into being themselves. This is, this is not uh, what Nietzsche is saying at all. In fact, it is the, what I've called already in these meditations, the willing of non-willing that is what places us in a relationship with the will to power. The will to power is the force or energia, energia of, um, of being. It is the ultimate force, if you will. It's the force that appears in different forms in, the, in a sort of fundamental way, the force of nature, any of the, the forces of nature, um, always reminding us that we are subjects to something much greater than we are, right? Um, that we are constantly in a state of relying upon a much larger system um, to just exist in a biological way. You know, we need the air, the water, the sun, all the things that we exist in. So um, again, my colleague Sam Rocha talks about being uh, as the sum total of all things, and then he talks about subsistence. So here we're talking about our capacity to subsist, to be at all, is to be in being. And so uh, for Nietzsche, my, it, the will to power is the force of life that runs throughout all of the system that maintains um, life. Also through things dying and being destroyed too. So it's not, an, it's, it's not a positive or romantic idea uh, is this world of power by any stretch, but it's neutral and it certainly has, is not about the individual will. It's a little digression there on Nietzsche. Um, so then hermeneutics, just quickly, and this quotation from Heidegger where he says that we are, so where I end, uh, we are interpreters of the gods. Um, that, is, um, that, is a, that is a really interesting way to end. It's a fascinating way to end. Um, 
messengers, right? Hermes, messengers of the gods. So why is hermeneutics um, the way of learning? Why is um, interpretation the way of learning? Why not just description? Um, well, um, I think I'm going to leave it at that. I think I'm going to leave it at that question and come back to it because um, I'm, I'm starting to extend this a bit too much. But that's where we're going to leave it, uh, where I left this last uh, uh, meditation, that uh, Hermes, Isentontheon, we are interpreters of the gods. So why is that? Why is hermeneutics um, interpretation? And what does it mean to be an interpreter of the gods?